you need to order that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, has everyone had a chance to look at the agenda? Do you have any requested changes? Hearing none, I'm going to deem it approved by consensus. Um, comments from the chair. Uh, John Adams wasn't feeling well tonight, so he was going to miss our meeting. And I also want to just mention about scheduling. The next meeting would be on Christmas Eve, but I think if you discuss this at a meeting I didn't attend, um, I don't intend you don't to call plan the to be meeting here. <laughs> yeah. for December 24th. Um, just skip. I mean, in, unless we have anything pressing that we need to have done before the new year and we can't accomplish tonight, then I, I think it's fine to skip the meeting. Um, you know, I would like to get the landscaping recommendations out today if we can. And if we can't, we should discuss at the end of the meeting whether we feel um, a sense of urgency to meet before the new year on a date other than Christmas Eve to do that. Um, a short special meeting could accomplish that if needed, but I'm hopeful we don't have to do that. Um, so assuming we don't need to do that, our next meeting will be on January 14th, I believe that calendar doesn't show yep. 2019 yet, but the 14th. 14th. So I just want to give everyone a heads up. We're gonna this, this is our last meeting in 2018, and then we'll meet on January 14th, unless we decide otherwise. Um, the other general business or the other comments from the chair I wanted to mention is um, Eric Gilbertson from the Design Review Committee and Historic Preservation Commission reached out to me, said that they're working on a proposal uh, for guidelines for changing the bylaws about the design review criteria. Um, and so he, he asked to just have lunch with me and give me an update on where they are. I haven't had that yet, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a progress report from what I've heard. Um, I've invited Kirby to attend the meeting with me, so anything I forget, Kirby track of um, and I, I think that's it um, for my comments so moving on item four, general business um, this is where we invite members of the public who want to speak about something that's not on the agenda to offer comments so I don't know if you have anything We're here to talk about I guess the slopes and the landscaping so which is both okay on the agenda. okay <laughs> all right do you want to just Come introduce yourself and give us your general yeah, sure. thoughts first, and then um, we can. Anyways, my name is Will Shabaum. Uh, I live here in Montpelier, and uh, general contractor. And um, I've been in front of you before, speaking about the slope issue. And uh, I came tonight just to see. My understanding is that you're sort of trying to fast track the slopes and the landscaping. And I see that as on the agenda. And I'm just curious what that, as far as an interim zoning thing, would that mean basically is like there will be, those will be adopted prior to all the other stuff that you're working on? Yeah, we've identified those as two parts of the zoning bylaws as drafted that have proven uh, administratively challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the idea is that we want to prevent as few future permit applications as possible from being impacted by some of those challenges. So if we can put forward a proposal to change the bylaws for the city council to review, then you know, we want to do that as soon as possible. Okay, well that's great. I guess that was my reason I'm here is just like, is that happening? Is it, you know, as a contractor, I've got a few people that are asking me, you know, because then we have projects where it's like a small portion of it's touching 30% slope. And, and they're just kind of like, when can we do this? And I was like, well, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's it's the top item on yeah. our agenda tonight, and you know, in general, right now. So. so basically, you'll be voting tonight to send those. Well, I can't guarantee people. anything. Yeah. But that's that's what we're hoping. That's the hope. We'll, we'll okay. Be able to vote well, tonight on a recommendation. As a contractor and a member of the public, I say, if you can, that'd be great. Do you have specific feedback for us to consider? Um, I mean, I think, you know, I've spoken with Mike about, and I've seen the sort of draft, at least for the slopes, and I haven't perused through the um, landscaping stuff. That's a lot more involved, I think. You know, I think it, it all makes sense. Um, you know, and I, and I agree that, you know, yes, having uh, 
development review board review anything over 30 percent and engineers that makes perfect sense um, you know depending on size and you know a lot of the projects that I deal with are very small scale you know it's like a 600 square foot cottage that's on a small hill um, or just an addition off the back that touches the hill you know I'm not putting up condo units on Sibley Ave or something you know um, so I think all in all it's where you're headed is the right direction and uh, just wanted to see when it was going to happen and hear what you had to say about that. Yeah, so I mean, even once we vote, it would just be a recommendation for city council that would then have to. Then they would have to adopt it. Yeah, and, and I, I believe they'd have to have a formal hearing process. So, yep. you know, even if we, best yeah. case scenario, we vote on something tonight, it could still be a couple of months. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right, understand. Right. So. You're the expert. Yeah, best would be, best, best case scenario would probably be end of January. Yeah. As far as when the potential to say apply for a permit under that interim zoning regulations would be? Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it could be end of January, early February. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. My understanding is that once uh, changes have been warned, then any new applications have to meet the the modified laws, although they also have to meet the current laws, right, at the same time? It, yeah, it makes a mess of things. So it's best to avoid that. State, state laws. Yeah, state I've been, laws I've been there awful. before where it's like right before the current regulations, and it was like, well, just wait until the new, these ones are in place, because mm -hmm. then you'd have to apply under two right. statutes, and they don't want to do that. So, But yeah, so I just wanted to get a sense of like when I could sort of expect to let people know they could do their projects. Yeah. We're doing the best we can. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, not and stick if around. If you have other comments, just raise your hand and we'll invite yeah. you back. Yeah. Also. I probably won't stick, a lot, stick around for too much longer, Understood. but I just wanted to <laughs> get a sense from you and, yes. you know, put in my two cents. So, all right. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. So, item five, we can jump right into the substantive, substantive discussion uh, reviewing the draft landscaping and screening standards. So the version that I um, provide you tonight is um, has a couple places where there were changes made. So the first one, we had voted at the last meeting to take out on page 358, number three. It's highlighted in yellow. Uh, I shortened that up. John Snell, I let John Snell know that we were talking about this and what the recommendation was that the tree board should adopt something so he said he was going to put it on their agenda for um, December and hopefully have it adopted in January so it may just be a placeholder um, but he is looking at the anti a 300s and not the best management practices so I know um, Miss Abbott talked about potentially that they were the the recommendation from the creators of these is that it may be that the best management practices would be, be uh, best, but it sounds like from John Snell that the tree board may be just looking to adopt the specific A300 standards. So, and I, I pulled up A300 at our last meeting, and there are many categories. Most of it's not relevant to planting, so it really isn't a portion of these standards. Um, and I think it's specific enough where it says plantings that it's not like we're trying to say that the all of the standards apply yeah. that we're being that we're specifying that it's only the planting yeah. portions are pertinent. Yep. Yes. And so, can you pull it up on a website? Because like, no, I'm. You can look at the listing, but you can't look at the contents. Right. So, yeah. so some we're going to have a copy. At yes. If we adopt the, these, we will the have board. to have a copy. Yeah. Downstairs. So I guess what I pulled up was like the table of contents, which was like yeah. eleven different categories, and one of which was planting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can we scan it and put it online? Probably not. Mm -hmm. I'll, yeah, he not ordered a copy, so just I was just gonna. I was contemplating whether I should order it, and then I figured I would go and see what their direction was before. I mean, they're relatively cheap. They're like twenty dollars a copy. I think that they weren't too bad. So when people ask about this, we can will you be sending them to the tree board, or just showing, telling them you found it's, a copy and they can come look at it? I think I think what it's going to end up being is we will have a copy, and depending on the project and depending on what it is, 
depends whether we would. A lot of times we have what are called TRC, um, technical review committees. And so when we have the TRCs, applicants come in and we invite everybody in. And I think if we had a project that was going to have a number of plantings, we would just have either Jeff Beyer or somebody from the tree board be there to go and answer questions of the specifics of the plantings if they're not already familiar. As we said, with the A300s, the advantage of those is a professional probably already knows those standards. So that's a little bit of the advantages they can, at least from the engineering firms, when they're printing out their, their plans, they can just go pull up the A300. A300 tree planting. Yes, here it is. <laughs> Um, so that was the first one. Um, I didn't delete it. I just put in a kind of a placeholder that reflected that. Um, so the next set of changes were actually on 361, um, where we get to the total site landscaping. But just above that, which is number seven, and this appears twice. This is just the, for the non-conformities for screening. Um, you'll notice highlighted 3%. Those did say 5%. And so what this says, where, where a site is non-conforming with respect to screening, the applicant shall be required to come into compliance less the cost of compliance will exceed 3% of the total cost. The reason why I dropped that from 5% to 3% is I was actually looking at our zoning that was in effect from 2006 to 2018 that just we just replaced and that one actually had a cap of three percent so we were trying to guess we were, I was like well some people do two percent <laughs> some people do as much as five percent well actually we used to do three percent so I just thought I would pick that we can certainly go back up to five percent if we wanted to but if we wanted to be consistent with what we had been doing for the past 15 you, years in the past it was three percent right. do you have any knowledge as to why percent was the standard um, a lot of like I said a lot of communities have these caps um, it just really comes down to what do you do in the case where somebody is coming in to um, put in a 300 uh, to put in a ten thousand dollar deck on the side of a restaurant to do some outdoor seating and they have a lot of non-conformities this just gives us an idea of how we can handle that. We know we want them to come into conformance, but with a $10,000 project, are we, we going to make them to do $10,000 worth of landscaping? They may not do the project at all. This just caps it at 3% to go through and say, you're going to have to do apply 3% of the project cost, whatever it is, to improving that nonconformity. So it will, over time, come into compliance if you're not. And then project who, at the time. who designates where that three percent goes in terms of how they, how much they come into compliance? Uh, in this case, it would it would depend on whether it's a major site plan or a minor site plan. So it would just be a if it's process. a minor site plan, it would be the zoning administrator. If it's a major site plan, it would go to the development review board. More bushes, less trees. I mean, you know, basically, it's yeah. kind of a choice like that. Then. Yeah, I mean, when you're looking at cost, it's really going to come down to you know what what is effectively and this is really talking about screening so yeah. in a lot of cases um, this is talking about somebody's building a deck but they have a dumpster that was never screened so we're gonna kinda know where it's gonna go you're just gonna have mm. to you know you have to apply at least three hundred dollars towards that Good. that requirement um, I don't know enough about what it costs to do landscaping how much screening is $300 get you on the $10,000 deck? Uh, maybe not a, a ton, but it's, a, as we said, we're looking at a percentage of the cost that's going to be going on top of that. Um, you're going to be able to get some, some work done for that, but like I said, it's, it's, uh, Just an overall cost. I think landscaping is fairly expensive, isn't it? I think it depends what you're. I mean, I, I imagine you could get at least a couple of shrubs planted for three hundred dollars. Oh, yeah. But a lot of projects we get are, you know, up to hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff. 
so as I said, it could be it. We can do whatever number that you'd like. Um, with what we, the issue we have right now is we don't have any regulations to help us with nonconformity. So if somebody can, comes in with a deck and we're left with, if I guess, yeah, if you've got fifty thousand dollars worth of landscaping needs, you're going to have to do fifty thousand. Um, and so we just needed to have some way of of regulating how we're going to do it. This is a typical way of doing it, 3%, 5%. You can make whatever percentage number you want. Do we want to set some minimum? I mean, you know, a small project, but could have a significant nonconformance. Um, uh, what are the um, advantages and drawbacks of having a higher percentage set aside for zone or percentage? Uh, um, I mean, so one would probably... Having a lower percentage would mean that you could have more development or infill. Is that accurate? I, I don't feel like I understand this well enough. To so this one is looking. Decision is. Yeah, this one's looking at nonconformities from the standpoint of, of strictly with the the screening, and I think total landscaping has a similar three percent, except they have an additional <coughs> requirement which we will go over. Um, Maybe we should look at these all together and get through all the changes. You yeah, need. so the 2-3%, so on the next page on 362, the same provision applies at topic that this one has an A because we also need to address where a site is nonconforming with respect to impervious cover. The applicant and the applicant demonstrates that the nonconform that as a result of the nonconformity, the site cannot reasonably meet the total landscaping requirement. The development review board may waive some or all the total landscaping requirements. So this just puts a second out mm -hmm. in there because we have sites that you might be in urban center two, and I can think of a couple of them that are 100% impervious, and therefore you're going to come in, you're going to have to do a project, we're going to say you've got to do 5%, 3%, whatever the number is, and they're going to look out and say, I have no percent. <laughs> I don't have any landscaping place I can put. Um, so either I'm going to have to tear up or tear down buildings, um, or I'm going to need a waiver. So this just gives an, an out for the Development Review Board to waive some or all the landscaping requirements based on the fact that there's just no place to put it. Um, but other than that, the, the percentage uh, amount of money to spend is, is still tends to, tends to be in there. And I think both of these, whether it's for the screening or whether it's for the total landscaping, would probably have the same percentage. Um, so in the tax world, because uh, when we're talking about like a chilling effect of something, like there's a lot of studies out there showing like a, a modest sales tax at like 6% doesn't really have much of a chilling effect. It's like there's like a lot of like research out there on that. And that's kind of how I'm thinking of this. It's like 3%, 5%, was the increased 5% the five is higher, would that have a chilling effect on projects? And yeah, I, I think of it as similar as like a sales tax. I don't really think it necessarily would have a chilling effect. That's my point of view. Yeah, I mean, probably not. I mean, we could, I mean, in theory, you could go through and say that all nonconformities have to be erased. I mean, legally, we could just go through and say you've got to bring them, you know. If you're going to get a permit, you've got to come into compliance, but we get a lot of smaller projects, and somebody says, I'm going to put a, a new propane tank in, we're like, great, you've got to put in $5,000 worth of landscaping, right, then we'll right. give you your permit. No, for I understand propane tank. the need for it. I think we're all convinced yeah. about mm -hmm. that. It's just a matter of what percentage is appropriate. and. Um, my first thought was, oh, I don't want to discourage some of the development that we want to see in like the urban center where there's not a lot of screening or landscaping. But then on the other hand, we want to have development that is aesthetically pleasing and contributes to um, good design and this whole part of it. So it, it, it does make sense to at least have some percentage set aside for this. I like that. Like no, I was just wondering when you were saying that, are there other um, re regulations, criteria that they have to meet other than landscape screening, um, you know, in terms of mechanicals um, outside a building? So, 
if they're all if what they are putting in is a new propane tank or new dumpster they would have to screen that dumpster this three percent doesn't let them out of that okay this three percent is just you're putting in something that's separate a deck mm -hmm. and now the question comes in we notice that you're also non-conforming with respect to your screening of your x and the question is do we make that happen um but screening is not just restricted to landscaping. No, it's not, which is why we don't worry about it. If it's 100% impervious, well, then you might have to put up a fence. Okay. So on the previous page, screening materials can be landscape buffers, but they can also be fences and walls. They can be berms. And that's those are the three options that you have for screening materials. And then what has to be screened are parking lots, utility service areas, and building-mounted equipment. And I'm comfortable with the 5%. I don't think that's that bad. I just thought I would point out the fact that previously we had 3% mm -hmm. as, as a number. It's good to know. It's just We're adding something in. Currently we have z nothing, yeah. and if we bring it in, there's a certain sales pitch you can give to go through and say, well, we're just going back to the way it was in, in that. But if we want to go beyond it, that's, as you said, I don't think the difference between... $300 worth of landscaping or $500 worth of landscaping is really going to go and take somebody's deck project out. What do folks think? 3% or 5%? I guess I probably agree with Kirby. I do. I'm going to say that more definitively. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, what increase it to something go to five? Five? Just I was, a 5%. I mean, I didn't. I suggested that. Yeah, that, I didn't think there was a clear. That, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't think I, that. The, yeah. Yes. Let you, me you restate. Go ahead and make the point. <laughs> I think five. Per, after hearing Kirby's valuable contribution, I think five percent is not. Does not seem like a. Too harsh a hurdle to put in, and it, landscaping seems like a. You know, even if it's two hundred dollars worth. Landscape more landscaping seems like a positive thing. So that's my take on it. Uh, I just have a quick question, Mike. You were saying, I mean, can you kind of give me just a, a ballpark? Like, what's the range in terms of the price of these projects that we're talking about? I mean, clearly there's like a $10,000 deck, but is that the norm? Are we talking? Most of our permits, we get a couple hundred permits a year. Mm -hmm. So most of them are going to be relatively small permits for changing windows in the historic district <laughs> or you know a lot of smaller projects in in those areas and then from there it ramps up to you know five million dollars for french block and you know some of these bigger projects but some of them are going to be exempt because of being in urban center one or whatever but we can most of those big projects are already covering themselves on different points okay. so it's it's really how we handle the small ones yeah, I, I just feel like if there's not a lot of difference on the margins in terms of the small projects, which it sounds like it is, and the larger ones are going to be covered with different areas anyway, and, um, and this isn't going to really touch those bigger projects so much, 5% is probably fine. <coughs> but frankly, I mean, this is sort of my first blush at it, so I don't purport to be... We just yeah, we, yeah, right. even <laughs> even us we we yeah. make this we put yeah. the, the the other this is this is fixing the previous proposal because yeah. we hadn't even thought of this until yeah. we started doing them. Yeah. And so it sounds like there's a consensus for five percent for screening and total landscaping, total site landscaping. Um, I did have I was given one question this afternoon related to that on is there a project that is just too small? Should we have a, a minimum? Project. Right, that's what Barb said. I was thinking more on the other from the other side though, a minimum amount for landscaping. Yeah, you were thinking minimum amount uh, for landscaping and more. the other one is yeah, the, the other, other one side is, is if somebody's doing a seven hundred and fifty dollar project, are we requiring 
I don't even think that would be seventy-five dollars, seven dollars and fifty cents <laughs> worth yeah, of right. landscaping. Yeah, I mean, right. is there is there a floor to some of these where we just go and say, look, if 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 landscaping is less than this, there's two options. One would be if it's less than this, you have to at least do X amount, which I think was what Barb was yeah. thinking. Or the other option is if it's less than this amount, we just we're not going to ask you to do landscaping if it's under if the landscaping requirement is under a certain amount. Well, what's an example of a seven hundred and fifty dollar project that would be none? Or We'll get small projects that might come in. Um, I mean, certain changes of use might just need a sign. Might just be a sign permit that'll come through. Mm. There's really no other changes, and so we're left with a, eh, what does that mean? Plant some flowers around the sign. <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't want to screen your sign by nature of it being a sign. <laughs> but you could screen the base of the sign, uh, yeah. But $7, I mean, that's pretty. It's, it's not a big flower. Right. <laughs> it's a small pot. Plant some seeds. And that doesn't even put it in the ground. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Just purchase yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I think I'm comfortable with an exemption for a small project, but I don't know if anyone else is It seems like it's a de facto exemption where it's, it's such a de minimis amount on those small projects that, I mean, Mike, you're not going out in, on the, in the field and enforcing, right? So, I mean, technically, we really shouldn't be writing rules that we have no intentions of, you know, going and saying, well, we'll just ignore that because yeah. I'm not going to be enforcing that. So, um, I mean, so but we should but, just but, put a de minimis where landscaping requirement, where the landscaping requirement is less than a hundred dollars, or fifty. I, I mean, oh, okay. I, I think that I mean the only hesitation I have with any of these numbers is that I don't have a good sense of, I mean, what it costs for a landscape professional just to even come out and sort of assess. I would assume that's. I just don't know what a hundred dollars gets you. Right, so I if you have hundred dollars and you need to plant something and you need to follow the ANSI three hundred standards, right. and you're just one person that doesn't. Yeah. Right, you can't hire someone to do right. That that's stuff. I it's sort of. There's some yeah. I'm thinking it's probably got to be in the three to five hundred dollar range before anybody even takes any of that seriously. We, we may guess. I just don't know. Well, you could put a substantial amount of landscaping in one specific area for three hundred dollars. You know, six bushes. You know, small enough to shield something. So if yeah, I, you know, if we want to set a minimum, I think it's <coughs> going to have to be small. The point I was getting at is like I don't think Mike's gonna be out there and say that bush only is worth eighty dollars, not a hundred. <laughs> you know that kind of thing. Where usually that we're gonna get that in the application stage. Yeah. People are gonna come in and go and say, "What are you gonna do?" And we're gonna yeah. come in and say, "You know, you you need to be doing something. What are you gonna be doing for for this amount?" Yeah. And so if the, if it's if we don't have a de minimis ex exemption, then people will say, "Well, seven dollars to buy a plant." But then you have to plant it following the ANSI A three hundred. That's part of it. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's such a small and it has thing. to be replaced if it dies because that's a requirement <laughs> yeah. under any landscaping oh. requirement. So yeah. you you give them the book. And so let's do a de minimis waiver for what like uh, I mean less than a hundred dollars. Hundred dollars, I guess. Yeah. Is that at least it's a number, and if it comes back that it's not high enough, we can always come back and go and say, look, we're getting a bunch of these that are just silly, or and then we can always come back. But at least a hundred dollars gives us something. There's something there. All right, everyone comfortable with that? All right. So, uh, the next, uh, so as we get into the total site landscaping, um, I made a few tweaks to the administrative rules. Oh, sorry, where are you? Where are you? Um, still, uh, it's the same page, 361. 3203.j. Yep, now we're into .j, the last of the total site landscaping where we, got stuck? where we got stuck last time so we had some questions that came up previously this had been talking about forested areas and we had some discussion about whether we should or shouldn't be regulating forested areas so I tried to do a little bit more massaging on this one and the riparian rules talk about naturally wooded vegetation so rather than create a new term of art I just grabbed the old one 
and replaced it to make this one say, so this is for calculating planting area, where an applicant demonstrates that naturally wooded vegetation is on the parcel, is proximate to the development site, and furthers the purposes outlined in section 3203.A. So that's the purposes of this section. The naturally wooded, wooded vegetation may count towards landscaping requirement on a two to one basis. For example, retaining two square feet of naturally forested cover or riparian habitat will count towards one square foot of landscaped area. So this puts the burden onto the applicant that they would have to demonstrate that it is on their parcel, is proximate to the development site, because some of these development sites can be rather big and we don't want somebody counting something that's clearly the purposes of the landscaping requirement is to improve the aesthetics and to screen bad things and blah, blah, blah. There are four requirements. Well, if it's up on the back of the hill, it's not going to do any of those four things. So this kind of gives a little bit of room for us to count that, but at the same time, they don't just automatically get credit for everything. Um, perennial plantings may be used. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. So that, that the point you're making there, where there's some discretion, administrative discretion, mm -hmm. you're, you're packing all that into the May that's there, right? Is that something we should make a little more explicit? Well, and the is proximate to the development site is arbitrary. Okay. It's, it's, okay. yeah, it's, it's a proximate little bit. to the development site or not is up to interpretation. If we think we know how we could grapple and wrap that in. I mean, we talk about proximate with other accessory structures and some other things. I mean, there'll be a certain amount of, of gray when it's the administrative officer making that call, but I think it could also be appealed to the DRB if somebody believes the administrative officer has said that's not proximate and great, you can appeal it to the DRB. And it's just, yeah, if you think that your office will exercise discretion on this May, then I think maybe we should have a standard to apply. But if you don't think that in practice you'll end up doing that, then that's fine. The way well, I guess if the applicant demonstrates, I guess the key is that should probably say shall. If, if we're looking at that, that May that's later in there, purpose outlined in Section 3, the woody vegetation, shall be counted. Because the assumption being that if the applicant demonstrates it, the administrative officer in the DRB always has to make the determination of whether or not it has been demonstrated. If you demonstrate it's proximate, if you demonstrate it's on your parcel, and if you demonstrate it meets these four purpose statements, we can count it on a two-to-one basis. And if we don't, it's because we're saying it's not. Um, I think that covers it. Mm. So is proximate to the development site. I'm just wondering, I mean, do we have a range or, I mean, Stephanie's point is well taken, but it's a little bit vague, so. It's a little bit vague, but I think if you, if you're looking at that proximate in relation to the purpose statement, because you have to meet all of them, so it's proximate. But it has to enhance the appearance of the built environment as viewed from a public vantage point, create shade along sidewalks, walkways, parking lots, provide landscape buffer between residential and non-residential uses, screening uses and development that creates the, that screen, screen the land uses and development that create visual clutter and distraction. So I think if you kind of know what the purpose is, so maybe the, we could or maybe the proximate doesn't have to be there at all if you can meet these four requirements. Yeah. I mean, you could say is proximate to the development site so that it furthers the purposes or something like that. But yeah, maybe we could just take it out. Take out the proximate. Yeah. You if you look at if you look at thirty two or three a. Yeah. Yeah, if it's if it's if it's if it's remote from the site, then yeah, it's going to be difficult to meet one meet of those. those four requirements. Yeah. I, I mean, how big a project, how a site are we talking about? I mean, if we have a several acre site, it's possible that they could meet these criteria and still not have it be close to the building. 
Well, it's the Where development. They... Yes, yeah, the development site that, which can be the site or the the site of the development. <laughs> yeah, we and we had this discussion of whether or not we wanted to define site because we talk about site plans and we talk about yeah. sites, and sites and parcels tend to be the same when they're small. I mean, yeah. you have a quarter yeah. acre site, it pretty much is the whole entire parcel. And the question is at what point, should, should we have a different, de different definition for site when it's something that's less than the size of the parcel? And that was a question that administratively downstairs we had been kind of chewing on a little bit to try to come up with, should we have a separate definition of site I'm thinking about the distillery project, you know, if there was a landscaped area at one far end of the project, I mean, is it possible that it could potentially meet these four criteria and still not be proximate to the disturbed area? Yeah, and I think that's. In here. I think that I'm fine leaving it in here. I think it's going to be yeah. a got called to some degree. If it's a nine acre parcel and they're doing a little bit of work over here and they're trying to count something away on the other side, I think there's a. Yeah, and I think I think that would there would be a good one. Helps. Think of timber frame, a nine acre parcel, right. and there's riparian buffer on the river on the back of this nine acre parcel. All their work is being done up by Route 12. Can they count that riparian buffer on the river? at the back of the nine acres towards their landscaping requirement. And my thought was, it's well, not it's not proximate. really proximate to the right. project. Mm -hmm. The project is in the front three right. acres, um, but it's on the parcel. And so that was where I was kind of, that was the one that was kind of rolling around in my head. So if we left proximate on in there, that would at least uh, Give you a basis. It, it would give us a basis to say no in a certain certain cases where somebody wants to count. You know. I'm okay with that. So I I just um, I'm gonna I don't mean to be contrarian, but I just disagree with that. Um, I don't see that the proximate verbiage is needed um, because you have the purposes outlined in 3203. If there, if the woody natural vegetation is not proximate to the built environment, it's not going to be able to enhance the appearance of the built environment, which is the first prong of 3203A. It won't be able to create shade along the sidewalks and walkways. Um, it won't be able to do the things that 3203A is is aimed at doing. Um, and I just feel like if I'm the review board, I'm looking at, if I'm weighing an applicant's demonstration of fulfilling those requirements, and then you add an undefined term such as proximate to the development without any standard for me to evaluate that, it just creates another level of uncertainty where I feel like if, you know, the board is going to be given discretion to determine whether or not those 3203A purposes are met, by the application, I think it should just be enough. But I just don't know what I just don't know what a undefined term of proximate to the development site adds to that. The the only case I can think of where something might not be proximate to the site, but but actually fulfill thirty two or three is is number three there, where it says providing a buffer between residential non residential, which arguably the um, the timber homes natural vegetation is a buffer between that and the, the, the development in the river. So you could say that it meets A3 here, mm. but maybe still isn't approximate enough. Sure, and I think that's, again, I think that's a call that the board can make if an applicant tries to make that demonstration. They can, they can make yeah. that call. I think that the approximate question just adds another variable that kind of muddles the analysis, but that's, that's just me. I, I, I can see the other side of the coin too. Don't get me wrong, but I, I feel like the thirty two hundred three A standards give at least some um, quantifiable and objective standard by which the board can evaluate an applicant's demonstration 
of a uh, you know, counting the land, uh, you know, counting the woody areas. <coughs> I could go either way. I, I, mean, I could go either way. I'm a proponent yeah. of getting rid of proximity, proximity <laughs> as part of it. What so do we I, got? I mean, either way there. But. Yeah, my, my initial point, and sorry for bringing this up and getting us into the weeds on this, was really that I think if you keep proximate in there, there's a possibly, if you, if you make a decision based on the proximate language, you could end up getting into some legal trouble with it. I don't feel that. Then they can apply either. to DRB, right? They can so, apply to DRB. The DRB yeah, make the DRB. decision. And, and they're the ones who make the decision ultimately. So they could also and they could also get into legal trouble <laughs> well, trying to interpret and apply so approximately. Many elements and, of interpretation. Right. But, you know, yeah. right, well, so, all of, you know, eight, and, one through and four not, are interpretation elements. Yeah, that's, I think yeah. That's, that's probably so, enough for them to handle them. Um, so if we take out proximate, then we take out the possibility that there's all these arguments about it that we don't intend to, to ever happen. Or leave it and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. I mean, cause I guess I, that same argument could be used for for the purpose, the, the elements raised in the purpose as well. So um, it's it's definitely a matter of interpretation. What's easier for your staff when looking at it? I, I mean, clearly from from the decision making standpoint, if you don't if we don't have to make that determination of whether it's proximate, then that's one less decision we have to make. Okay. I was just if we find we get ourselves caught in a position where we're approving things that we don't want to because we don't have that. We can always come back and either define that term or, you know, as we said, we're, we're improving something that doesn't exist. So anything is an improvement over what we have. And I think, um, like I said, I was just trying to capture a little bit of those projects where people come in with the big, you know, some Malone properties on Gallison Hill that they've got you know, big industrial building up front, and then they own another 15 acres of woods in back. And I know the question is going to come up of, well, doesn't that just meet all my landscaping requirements? It's like, well, but I guess now we've got the, the basis in there. Well, if you can demonstrate 3203A is met, then sure, yeah. you all can right. count that. But do we want them to count that? I mean, do, is that the ultimate result that we want to see happen? Well, the purpose of our landscaping standards are to implement those four standards. So all of these standards that we've been reviewing are to achieve those four things. If there's something, if there's a fifth thing we should be adding, then I guess that would be the next question. Well, no, I mean, I guess it seems like it's splitting here. It's that potentially they could argue that it meets those four criteria, but it's still halfway across, you know, it's still an uh, acre away from where they're developing. So do we want the landscape standards to apply to the area that is being developed? Well, of course. And I think that the, the argument isn't about whether we want those to apply or not. The argument is about whether this achieves it with or without the term proximate. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess I can think of all kinds of different ways to get around it. So it's <laughs> But if it's, if it's a nine-acre parcel and it's all on the back acre, is it enhancing the appearance of the built environment as viewed from the public vantage point? Right. right. Well, maybe the public. I mean, it may. It may be. If you think about the state house, it may be yes, because yes. that back hill is all forested and acts as a forested right. screen for the back. If well, it happens to be flat. Call that development clutter. <laughs> yeah, but it's but it's well, it's whether it, it's meeting it, it when it comes to the next one where we're talking about the total landscaping requirement. Um, I think right. for a lot of them, they're not going to meet that first one. All right, yeah. so without taking an official vote on this, how, raise your hand. How many people want to strike the, the proximate aspect of this? I mean, I guess it would be fine. Yeah. Right. And how many people want to keep it? Two people want to keep it? Uh, no, I'm just like, I don't, I'm not sure, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> totally so. I think All I right. talked myself into thinking cover it without that. All right. All right, far view. Goes down. Do you want an official vote? To no, I don't care. <laughs> talking about the dissent. Really. But okay. I do, you know, I do have to say that I constantly think about these in different ways that I could get around them <laughs> in oh. terms of site design. You know, so it's sort of like, oh, well, yeah, I could I could easily do this and, and the, you know, the natural area would be <laughs> half a mile away. But um, anyway. Yeah, we'll, we we'll look and see how happen. it, yeah, we'll look and see how it plays out in, in, yeah, in, in the real reality. Um, and sometimes we just have to see how the DRB 
comes down on a couple of these because if the DRC, DRB starts being very consistent in, no, we're not going to count that yeah. um, for X, Y, and Z. Or we'll count only a portion in the front of it mm -hmm. because, yes, these first 50 feet are actually making a nice backdrop to the restaurant or whatever, but the last 750 feet of it are not providing any benefit and therefore we're not going to give you any credit for those. But we'll see where the DRB plays it. Okay. So um, here's the change I see is, is proximate to the development site is going to be struck. Yes. And then um, may is going to be changed to shall. Yeah. Well, I'd be curious to see where some of the other DRB ones are, but we'll make those. What, what's that? Oh, I was just trying to think about Occasionally it's written where the DRB may approve where the applicant demonstrates. I don't think, but we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll put it as shall because I think actually if the, if the applicant demonstrates, I think legally, if the applicant does demonstrate it, we are kind of obliged to give but them that. But the decision that. of whether they've adequately de right. demonstrated, demonstrated that, that is, is yeah. up to the yeah. others. Um, so B moving us quickly in the next one. B actually is just moved up from later on. I noticed that we talk about perennial plantings and then we have these administrative rules up top and it really should have been part of these mm -hmm. administrative rules. So perennial plantings, when it comes to total landscaping, if you're planting perennials, they can be counted on a one square foot basis. Um, okay. And then C, um, I added <coughs> in, because we've had a number of these questions that have come up and I think this will help clean some of the stuff too. To be counted as an existing tree or shrub for the purposes of this subsection, trees and shrubs must be healthy and have suitable planting area to support its long-term viability. Unmanaged or unmaintained portions of a site shall not count as landscaping unless the area meets the provisions of 3203J1, which we just talked about. Um, invasive species shall never be counted towards total landscaping. So the purpose of this is we have had people who've come in with applications and you'll have a tree growing sideways out of the foundation and then <laughs> kind of turn and kind of grow up and they're like well there I got a tree that counts as my tree and we're like well yeah it is a tree but you know or it's or it's just brambles with a bunch of junk in there and you're just like is that is that really, should that really be counting towards our existing landscaping if it's not really landscaped? If, you know, and you can, if you drive and look around, you can see between buildings on Barry Street and different things, you'll go and see that just in between the buildings is just grown up scrub. Mm -hmm. And does that really count as counting these things out and go through and say, I found seven maples in there, so. Nothing else, maybe it would encourage people to maintain them, the ones that oh, are yeah. there. Oh, yeah, so that's know? the point so. was we would be able to at least, if we go and say, if you want to count it as existing, do something to kind of make it qualify. We aren't obligated to take your tree <laughs> <laughs> as a tree. My, my other thought is with um, the yeah, ash borer, in a few years, we're going to have trees that are not healthy. Yeah, ash borers or um, another common yeah, tree. That's going to get people to actually replace those trees, which might be a good thing. Yeah, uh, Trees I, of Paradise, I have a, um, I have a, a couple of other trees. Sorry, sorry, I have a quick name, yep. 3203J1C. Oh, quick question, um, the second to last sentence, unmanaged or unmaintained portions of the site shall not count as landscaping, and the last sentence is invasive species shall never be counted. Why is there different verbiage? If one is shall not count as landscaping, the other one is shall never be counted towards total landscaping, is there a reason why there's different? Probably should say not. Just shall, shall, shall not count shall towards. Be counted towards. Sorry, I was keeping. I just being. Yes. I'm just. Sorry. I was being overly. Sorry. We lost a couple lawyers, so we needed to sorry, get one back. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I just know. I, I won't. In relationship to that, Mike. So then they need. The owner needs to go into um, their area and determine if they're invasive species, within a, a forested area. No, it, no, not, it, I mean, if, if they were doing, if they're going for the forested area, this is just for a site. And we, we'll get a number of them that will come in um, that are just, uh, even some of these Berry Street, Elm Street projects mm -hmm. that, you know, it's just a small 20,000 square foot lot, and there's just a section of of something that's in, in brambles, and this is questions whether they can count those as trees. Um, 
So but as have... they start mapping them out to go and tell us, you know, we're going to ask them, do you, you know, do, do you meet your tree requirement? And if they go through and say, yeah, I've got a tree here, I've got a tree here, and I've got two trees over here, and we can go and ask them what, what are they. Because okay. first of all, we need to know because we have to determine is this a large tree, medium tree, or right. a small tree. And if they go and tell us, well, that's a X tree, we can go through. We, we can look because we've got the list or know that, and well, a tree of paradise is an invasive species and therefore doesn't count. Yeah, unfortunately, we have a lot of invasives. But, so we have a clear designation of a list of invasive <coughs> species that they can reference. The in the zoning. List. The state, and it's referenced it's in here. The, okay, so the state list is referenced in yep. the zoning. And I don't, this doesn't apply to the natural woody vegetation. That's when you're, this is when you're specifically counting exact what, trees. So if you have invasives existing. in your natural woody yep. area, you're yeah. gonna, this yeah. doesn't apply to that. <laughs> Go and right. survey your two acres of wood right. itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hoping we can get through this in five more minutes so we have an hour to talk about slopes. All right. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to need it. <laughs> oh, no. So just uh, s skipping to the bottom of that, you'll see number four. We already talked about this previously, so I will make the changes that we approved. The percentage. The percentage and the wording of any of anything else. So we'll make those. So the last thing that comes up is back up on number two, which was what we left at. There used to be a two and a three. Yep. And the two talked about lots less than one acre, three talked about lots more. And John made comments that that were absolutely correct. It really wasn't, I didn't have it right. I made mistakes. And so I spent a lot of time, again, playing around with a bunch of more examples. And what I've put in here is a more complex one, but there are a number of ways of trying to get us to A number that works. But one possibility is to go back and move to a factor of, um, if we apply a factor of 0 0.033, which you see is the requirement just for the 90%. And we just, if we just took that out and just said, look, we're just going to apply a factor of 0 0.033, it actually kind of works through all the districts. It does apply just a minimum, and you're looking at it as, as a minimum. Um, it works at no matter what the size of the parcel is. And I ran this all the way out to um, projects like uh, tractor supply, which is a 20,000 square foot building with a 20,000 square foot outdoor storage area with another 60,000 square feet of parking. That one didn't have enough landscaping, but I think all of us could go out there and go and say it didn't have enough landscaping. But the biggest thing it didn't have was landscaping enough shading for the parking. So if it simply met its parking shading requirement, it would meet the 0.03 requirement. Um, the other thing I looked at was we all kind of thought the shading requirement worked okay, so I converted that to our new system of impervious cover. That comes out 0 .042, so that's not too bad. You know, we're starting to see numbers all in the same area here of, of stuff that, that tends to work. The number that didn't work when I calculated out our current zoning, which, you know, has absurdly too much landscaping which is why we're we're redoing these rules it came out to 0.19 so you start seeing okay well now that's an upper limit 0.19 we don't want to be up that high um so we played i played around with a, a lot of different examples um from tractor supply caledonia spirits and looking at some of them and kind of giving an eye to them as to whether or not they really could have, like Caledonia Spirits, I think we recognized could have had a little bit more landscaping. It would have been fairly easy to have provided more landscaping. Um, and really started to come up with that the, the point 0.033 would work as a across the board 
for any of them, just get the impervious cover multiplied by 0.033. That's the amount of landscaping you, you could meet. In certain cases, it might be a little bit on the low side. So the other options which you see here in number two, the most complex way of doing this is we looked at, you have the building size and you have your other impervious cover like parking lots. We already know the parking lot requirement gets up to 0 0.04 and that kind of works. So we could just go through and say structures have to meet this and the other landscaping has to meet the other number. And this, this just goes and says the other parking lot would be 0 0.033. So if you've got a parking lot that's basically smaller than 10 parking spaces, you're at 0 0.033. As soon as you hit 10 parking spaces, you're at 0 0.042. I don't have to say that here because the previous requirement would push it up there. And then the buildings would add, would go from 0 0.033 to 0 0.0625 to 0 0.086. And then everything else would be at 0 0.1. That gets a little steep, so that's kind of the high end. Now you're we're requiring a more robust amount of landscaping. If you went up to 0 0.1, we could stop it at 0 0.086 if we wanted to. So I was just trying to get some ideas out there for, for how the, the simplest and straightest is just go for the 0 .033, and that's the quick and clean way of, of doing it. It works for the small ones, and it works for the big ones. Are we aware of any other cities that have different factors or different approaches for structures versus impervious surface? <coughs> not really I haven't seen some of the issues that have come up with landscaping is that a lot of times it is a strictly subjective standard they will do a more of a performance span standard approach most communities would go with take your purpose statement pull those out stick them in as performance standards and go and say you have to demonstrate this the problem with this with that is we're trying to have a lot of our stuff be administrative, so we really want to start to be a little more objective, a little less subjective in, in our rules so that way our administrators can go through and process because most of our applications, you know, we get a couple hundred applications a year, 12, 15 of them go to the DRB, you know. So if we send site plan and say all site plans have to go to the DRB, then we're sending a lot to the DRB to, to evaluate the reasonable person standards mm -hmm. and the subjectiveness. So we tried, as we said, we tried some of the way Brandy's been proposing to do it. Um, we think this new way kind of tweaks what she's doing, puts it on a better foundation because we're linking it to the size of the buildings, at least the footprint and the size of the parking areas. Because by linking it to impervious cover, we've got a more impervious cover, the more landscaping you need. Seems like a pretty reasonable. And previously, we talked about the distillery, and we all got that example. So I think a lot of us, it helps to talk about these examples for us. Because mm -hmm. we can imagine how many trees and, and acreage, but it's hard to take the math and get there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell us what, like, what we're looking at now, how that would look compared with what we discussed last time with the distillery project, where we went to some depth on. Um, meeting the other requirements too? Were they meeting now that they They didn't have to meet any requirements previously. So we were kind of taking it because they were under the old zoning. So was it but were they would they have met, I guess is my question. So would they have already have had to add more for parking or for yes. spending? Yeah. Because that's part of it too, I think. If we if we look at that side and say this wasn't enough, well this is an addition to those if it's lower, right? No, these aren't in addition. These are uh, the well, total landscaping, yep. You may meet your total landscaping requirement before you get here. It's this was right. kind of intended as in our current zoning, total landscaping is actually kind of at the top or in the middle, and we kind of wanted to make sure it was clear. We put it at the bottom, we relocated all those standards to go through and say we've got screening, street trees, parking, and screening are the three requirements, but. Each one of them has exemptions. Right. So you might get all the way through there and you don't get to go and say yes to the landscaping. 
no, you do have a minimum. You have to at least meet this much. You may meet it through your street trees. You may meet it through. Right, that's what I meant. In yeah. Right. So but if you've met the other things yeah. and you're already over this amount, you don't have to do it. So then this, you won't have to do did anything. Did this end up applying to the distillery project, or did it, was it met already from this parking and other? And it sounds like they, if they had been not. under this rule, they would have had to do more before this. Yes. They were adopted under old zoning, but oh, yeah. But, yeah. If, but, uh, if, yeah. They but if they were, zone. they would have failed our new zoning. Mm -hmm. Um, we have old, we have older zoning, old zoning, and yeah. we, <laughs> we have old zoning, <laughs> current zoning, and proposed zoning. <laughs> yeah. but, yes, right, but under. But if they'd been under this rule, not including this, they already would have had to do more because they wouldn't have met the parking requirements. Yeah, they least. would have. Yeah, they would not have had enough parking shading. So that's and I think looking at the site plan, we would have agreed, at least as planning commissioners, that it would have been reasonable for them to have provided more shading for that parking lot of that size. But this will give a would give them a numerical number to use to say, okay, this is the area that needs to be provided as a minimum, and here's where it should be. Some of it should be shading the parking. Some of it should be in other locations. Yeah, they will meet the other. They'll, they'll go through and meet those first three requirements, and then we will get to the total landscaping where we add everything up and see if they've met. And if they're still if they're deficient, we'll have to add some more parking or add some more landscaping Somewhere. in one of these six or seven places that are identified. So when you say these factors, you sort of work them out in your head and they make sense, what does that mean exactly? Like you feel like you look at examples and they have, I'm just trying to grasp what that, that they don't have too much of a burden of landscaping, but. It, uh, in, in certain cases, I look at a project. Um, so some of the new ones, I looked at Hunger Mountain Co-op uh, Caledonia Spirits uh, we had looked at before, 184 Elm Street we looked at before, Tractor Supply was a new one that I looked at, um, the, I Burger, the but, Buddy's, Buddy's Burgers. That's the question. Yeah, thank you. For <laughs> all of these ideas, as, as we try to kind of flesh out these ideas, um, which numbers seem to make sense, um, so what I would do is, let's say, if I happen to be working on an idea of like, maybe we do a .06 for the building and a .03 for the parking lot. I can, I would run them through Hunger Mountain Co-op and go and say, well, what did the total come out to? And what did they plant? And do I think, in my personal opinion, do I think there was enough landscaping there? Um, in some cases, if it comes out, it's like, yeah, it was, they, were, they would be a little bit short, or it's unclear whether those were medium trees or large trees. If those were large trees, then they would count, and they would meet it. If they're medium trees, then they're not. But So that's kind of how I looked at them. Um, like, Hunger Mountain Co-op has 30,000 square feet of impervious. They have 22 medium trees and nine small trees. Now we can start adjusting the things. Is, is that enough? landscaping in that parking lot. It doesn't count any of their riparian buffer that they have along the river. Just So would that meet the total landscaping as we have in this proposed version? In certain cases, I'd have to, if it's... I don't hear this calculator. <laughs> so I think, I mean, Ariane's getting at it, which is there's two things to consider here. There's administrative ease of implementing which is very important, and we leave it to you to determine the best way to do that. But then there's the substantive question of how much landscaping is the appropriate amount. And so in testing your administrative formula, you know, we kind of want to know, like, how did you arrive, how did you settle on this particular factor? What were you looking at? And yeah. you're using your professional judgment in determining what was the adequate amount of coverage and landscaping. And that's perfectly acceptable, but we just want to make sure we're having a discussion about yeah, and that's, yeah, and it's, it's hard somewhat. I mean, like in this case here, we're talking about Hunger Mountain Co-op. Um, 30,000 square feet of impervious cover. If we just did 0 .033 for everything, that means they would have to do 990 square feet of landscaping, which for everyone who's not up to speed with what we're doing, a large tree would be worth 100. A medium tree would be worth 49. A small tree is worth 25. Shrubs are worth 6 or 8 or 10. Um, perennial landscaping is one to one. Um, so they would have more than enough because you said nine large trees and they would have enough. They have medium. twenty-two medium, uh, twenty-two medium trees and nine small trees, which is thirteen hundred and three. So they would have met 
the minimum requirement. Yeah, now they, that doesn't, they may have been way over if we looked at it from the standpoint of parking, we may have said, well, for parking, you actually needed to have more and bigger trees. They may have been required to have 1,500 square feet of medium mm -hmm. trees or something, depending on how big. So what I'm, what I'm hearing, because again, I'm trying to conceptualize, and sorry, I if I can No, that's, there. that's but, but a .033 sounds like a small enough number for the um, uh, total tree that it's, it sounds like it's going to usually be caught by parking before it gets to that. It sounds like point, what, what I'm understanding is a .033 is so lenient that it's probably not going to catch anything that's not already caught by the other standards. Does that seem right? For certain projects, if we're talking about Hunger Mountain Co-op and Tractor Supply, we're talking about places that have big parking lots. So absolutely, there a lot of their, if they meet their parking lot requirement, they're probably meeting most of their total landscaping requirement. And in yeah. fact, I would almost guarantee they are because the parking lot is landscape is required at 0.042. So if you have a lot of parking and our requirement for total is 0.033, then you're going to probably okay. meet it all. But Buddy's Burgers has no parking. It's just the building. They don't even own their parking lot. That parking lot's owned by the abutters. So when they want to put a deck on their building, and I calculated theirs, Theirs comes out to needing 75 square feet of landscaping. And they have some small squares in the front. Um, they actually have one crab apple tree. So we're like, all right, look, you put a crab apple tree here, you put a crab apple tree there, and you have some ewes, which they do have. You could meet 75 square feet pretty easily in in that. And that's that's, a, that's about as urban as you're going to get. Mm -hmm. um, you know, probably 90 plus percent coverage on that parcel, and they still they still could meet it. So it works for really small ones, the .033. Um, but as I said before, when you get up to some of these middle-sized ones, it can be it'll probably be met through other things like parking, and it'll be a little bit on the low side. But then when we get to these really big sites. That was where we were coming to this point where we kind of have this, it's not a linear thing. As the lot, sites get really big, it becomes really easy to meet a requirement. And you also have a lot of these extra existing trees. And you're like, oh, I need seven trees and I've got three acres. Which seven trees would you like me to pick? Uh, and that was where some of these ones just come up for the other extreme of the really big lots. Um, and then I think these middle ones are where we make at Hunger Mountain Co-op. <coughs> so that was my thought and as I as I said some of these I the numbers I pulled together we had done the parking lot calculations and 0.042 is how that factors you know so I think we kind of have a feel it just depends a little bit of you know if we want to have a minimum here's some ideas to go with 0 0.033 0 0.042 we had come about it in different ways and kind of came back and found these other numbers. I think we just need a number or, or as I proposed kind of in the written example, to split it between your buildings are going to be factored at one rate and your other impermeates at another rate. It's a little bit more complicated, but we can do it. Sorry, Mike, where was the point oh four two? Uh, it's not technically written in here, but it... I, and I can always go back and convert it. If you were to look at the parking lot requirements, so the minimum planting for 0.8, which would be page 360, minimum planting requirement for number three, minimum shall be 40% of the area. So 40% of the parking area I added the words including aisles and driveways because it was unclear. Mm -hmm. um, but B, each large tree shall be considered to be 1,200 square feet. Each medium tree shall be considered to be 600 square feet. So if you kind of take those 1,200 and 600 and go to the 40% parking area and do all the math on it, it comes out 0.042.
because I was kind of curious about where the numbers would play out. So, yeah. so I knew, you know, like I said, when I did for the existing zoning, if I building perimeters and the requirements, that came out. 0.19, so that's much higher. So I think I think we're in a range that could work. It's just going to be a has to be 0 0.033 for the 90 percent district. Because of the very small. Just because there's very little land that's left for landscaping. So I think that has to be there. So if we're going to do something, it starts at that. Maybe there's just everybody is this except for that one district or. 90% is this, 80% is this, everybody else is something else. I think if, if you want my recommendation, I'm somewhat tempted to go with the 0 .033 and kind of just see how that goes. As it's, it's written here. It's a lot here. cleaner. It's, a, lot like cleaner. it's a minimum. It's a minimum standard. I think a lot of people are going to meet it. In, I think it's going to catch the ones we want to catch, the people who don't have any or are really insufficient. It adds a little bit more to a couple of projects that we have all recognized. You know, I think if, if I looked at 0 .033 and it said Caledonia Spirits is good, then I think I would be a little bit more likely to say, I don't know. I think we've all kind of agreed that needed a little bit more landscaping. Well, on but, the flip side, though, the struck like taking the structures into account with the numbers you gave, errors on the side of more trees? Yeah, it would add more trees, yep. If, if we factored structures at a higher rate, um, then we would end up with more trees or, or more landscaping. Yeah, separating the two seems unnecessarily complicated to me, though. Structures from other impervious. It's more difficult to to do the, the building that it is for other impervious cover. They do have sort of different characteristics, you know, different aspects to them. Right. So um, I never thought about doing it separately, but... From the public's point of view, they tell you their square footage for their structures and their square footage for their impervious, right? They just and give you us tell impervious. them the square footage they need for landscaping, yeah, that's, right? Yeah, that's so the way it would the work. Uh, perspective, right now, we're not tools. asking them to differentiate. We just ask yeah. them for an impervious cover. How much of your property is impervious cover? Uh -huh. They don't split between the two. Which either way is still simpler, I think, if there's a way to do it. Yeah. And, and just but for example, the, the, the Caledonia Spirits, we had calculated that the site plan had 1,600 square feet of landscaping with a 0 .033 on everything, it comes out to 2,635. So they would actually have to add, okay. with that factor, a, a thousand more uh, a thousand more square feet, which, again, as we said, with, with that site as empty as it is, it... That's, what I, that's what I needed to hear yeah. to be able to conceptualize, like, what the point oh three three means. Yeah, so I'm sorry, so that was just the point three three applied? Yeah, it's just the okay. that, yeah. There's no higher factor for the for the building for the building. Yeah. Okay. But ultimately, they need to be able to provide your with the square footage of the building as well. I mean, maybe not. Yeah, for other reasons, but, but not for, for other permit yeah. applications. So it's not as if you're asking them for information that yeah. they don't. The question that comes up at that point is once you start having structures, buildings, is where where, where things fall into the gray area of whether it's a structure or a building of a... So is your recommendation yeah. <laughs> for all <laughs> districts and all impervious cover, the factor be 0 0.033? Yes. Oh. As written here. It's not, it's not as written here. I would have to amend this. I kind of put the more complex version in here so you could actually visualize it and really? see it. Yeah. It's easier to go through and say, <coughs> we're just going to strike it all back to number one and or A and the factors... Point zero three three. So we get rid of B through D, and then the in districts with maximum cover A would be changed to just, just the factor is, the the factor is yeah. yeah. For all uh, impervious That's cover? true, yeah. We know. But so then that removes all the stru uh, structure yeah. pieces. Yep. Right. 
Uh, so in... I think you just add this to two to determine the square footage of planning yeah. area that will yeah. be required. Multiply point zero three three with yeah. the square footage yep. of the total proposal. I, I'm comfortable with that. I mean, this is the one. I'm comfortable with that. We have so this start with simple. If it doesn't work, we go to more complex later. <laughs> so, so where <laughs> it might not work, around. it sounds like, is in a more rural, larger project where the point of three three might it might stand out because it might be too little landscaping because it's something that's big that's out somewhere. But in the urban area, it seems like yeah, because there's already stuff crammed in that the point of three three is going to work fine. Yeah, I think I think where it will work the least is with somebody who may have a parking lot of nine parking spaces, so they miss out on the point oh four two. So they end up in the total landscaping, and I, I think there's some scenarios which could play out. But again, when we're looking at this, we're trying to look at it as a minimum, and I think a lot of cases come up, people aren't meeting even the point oh three three minimum. So I think this is already going to push people up to a higher standard and I think if we find there are examples where it's not still not being pushed far enough, you know, again, we've already looked at uh, uh, three projects that were approved under the previous zoning that each one of which we said, oh, we would have probably wanted to see more different landscaping in those, whether it was Caledonia Spirits, even Hunger Mountain Co-op could probably, depending on whether they were large trees or medium trees, I think we would have been better about making sure their trees were more appropriate for shading those parking lots so being replaced. How does this uh, um, apply to say future developments where that have no parking? Um, like buddies. Oh, no. What's that? Yeah, like buddies. Like buddies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or yeah, I'm, or you well, know, as we t decrease the amount of impervious cover that we contribute to parking, so that there in that point three. Th 0.033 is just applying to the building footprint itself. So in that case, it's lower than what you were proposing here because the 0.03 is lower than the But I think in those cases, structure. what you would find is this is the amount that's landscaped. So if you're, if you don't have a parking area and you have, your alternative is you need to have a certain amount landscaped, the rest of it's going to be grass because well, we hope so. It's, it's not impervious. It's not impervious, and it's not <laughs> landscaped. It's got to be something that's kind of falls into. It. So I think this is really looking at having a arithmetic way of being able to say how many trees and shrubs, mm -hmm. so we don't end up with just lawn. Um, we end up with some shade. I mean, the overall goal is to mitigate the the surfaces, the urban heat island, right? So yeah. that. You know, it depends on. I'm just trying to imagine how that would be affected as we reduce the amount of of land developed as parking. So, I mean, it could still could basically come out as a wash. Just want to make sure we don't encourage more parking. That's all. Yes, yeah. and what we didn't want to do is to have the the factor get. And I mean, if it's decided, it doesn't really matter. We didn't want to have the factor for parking get above the 0 0.04 because you're already meeting, because mm -hmm. then we're having to make up more landscaping somewhere else for the impervious cover that's already been taken care of. And so people with a lot of parking lot may end up with lots of additional landscaping somewhere else to make up for the fact that their parking lot landscaping didn't provide enough. So that would be the maximum for the parking lot landscaping is at 0 0.042. But as long as it's 0 0.033, people may have more. We hope people will have more. People may have more simply because they meet one of those other requirements under screening. I mean, remember, if they're if you've got a um, a, res, a non residential next to a residential, you have to provide screening to protect the residential uses that are next door. Mm -hmm. And you don't get to come into the DRB and say, "Yeah, but you guys can only make me plant seven trees because that's all." No, it works the other way around. You do your screening first, then we see if you meet your landscaping Minimum. requirement. Yeah. yeah. And it might encourage you to landscape to meet your screening with landscaping instead of fencing. Yes. Yep. If you have to meet screening anyway, 
Yeah, if you already have meat screening and it gives encouragement for people to support planting street trees because your street trees count. Um, so, All right, so I think we're good. Is everyone comfortable with that approach? We can revisit it if needed. Yeah, can I just, one quick question. Mike, I just want to say thanks. This is like a very elegant solution to a sticky problem that we've been grappling with the last couple of um, meetings. And I don't mean to, I don't doubt the rigor with which you've come up with these numbers, but I'm just curious, how many, um, like how many models did you crunch or how many hypotheticals did you crunch to come up with the number? I just. I would say at least, I would say between 10 and 15 different examples of pulling out site yep. plans and counting the trees and what's out there and looking at examples and and this has been reviewed by Audra who is the um, assistant zoning administrator and Meredith who's the zoning administrator and we've kind of chewed over the different yep. and they would throw out very specific examples okay. what about the problem on Berlin Street we had a big problem on Berlin Street with this particular one and we would pull it out and say well under the old rules they needed 14 trees and 87 shrubs under the new rules it's this and they're like oh well that's actually reasonable <laughs> okay. that's good. Yep. Thanks. 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 So. anything else in the landscape is that it no i think that's that's it i can i'll make these changes i think the only thing that'd be pending would be what the tree board comes up with for yeah. that which I may just have to make a decision on that. If it gets to the city council and the, and the tree board hasn't made a decision, then I guess I would recommend that that get pulled. But otherwise, I think we would keep it in there for now. Or do you guys want me to pull it and add it later? In Because we have two processes, so everyone remembers. We've got this fast track on this one, and then we've got the right, second one. one. I could always go and add that on the second one if we want. The second punch list, so that would just get struck. So I like the placeholder that you put in. I think it's fine. Okay. This is on, what, what is three fifty-eight. Yeah, I mean, I guess unless hypothetically they don't adopt something consistent with the ANSI standards, I yeah. can't imagine that. But I don't. Well, I'm a little hesitant. Do we can always recommend a change. Sure. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense. I think it's I think it's fun. I think people can it's something people can follow and I don't think it's gonna actually cause any um, administrative snags anyway. I Do I have a motion to forward the revisions to the landscaping and screening section of the zoning with the modifications that we agreed upon tonight to city council? So moved. Second. A second. Any discussion? Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, and the motion carries. Okay, we have a draft. Yeah. Great. All right, so I think you might be the one. Barb moved. Ariane. Yes, Barb okay. moved. Ariane okay. seconded. We got it. We got it. That's item five. Moving on to item six. This is about a half an hour. Well, 25 minutes. We have to get to our minutes. <laughs> last time. So, um, Aaron, I think you're coming into this cold. Uh, the slope, the slope issue. So, um, as part of the punch list of issues with the zoning that was recently passed, Mike brought up this issue of this prohibition on building on slopes uh, over 30 percent and it is there are no exceptions to the rule as written right now um, waivers waivers um, and and therefore it, there were certain instances where it was coming up and it didn't necessarily make sense to deny the application like when for example a retaining wall is being built that would naturally be a slope higher than 30 percent so um, we had some discussion about that and I think there, there's two parts to this one is the prohibition on slopes and the second part is the calculation of density uh, previously we, we the intent was to have that calculation be built on the buildable area mm -hmm. on a lot um, 
the proposal that we've received from staff would be to cut that uh, calculation because the calculation was proving to be administratively um, very difficult with the data that we have now. That's my understanding of the issue, Mike. Is there anything else I missed? No, nope, that pretty much. Yep. The, the, these changes are actually unlike what you just went through. Um, and if anyone doesn't have them, this still has the landscaping on the back half, but if somebody wants to see the, the slope ones, I've just got a couple of these left. Um, uh, what's the date on that? All right. Uh, well, this was of the 11.7. So the changes here are actually pretty straightforward. Which page? So this is kind of a strikeout. So on this page, this just deletes under 302.C M. There used to be a section in there that would go and say, in all other districts, the maximum residential density shall be based upon the lot's buildable area rather than total acreage or square footage which does not include any land with slopes greater than 30% as mapped on the attached map mm -hmm. or wetlands or these other things. So that, in this case, the policy is very, I wouldn't say complicated, it's, it's um, that's what we're really talking about rather than wordsmithing because it really is striking that thing that says we're going to use buildable area and then Two pages later on 317, the actual changes here go through and it used to say all development of land in this category is prohibited and same with the engineered plans, all development on the slope is prohibited. What we've said is all development shall require a hearing, all development on this land shall require engineered plans. So those are the pretty I guess the, the what's changing is pretty straightforward. The question is, should we make that change or not? Yeah, so staff recommendation was to, um, as far as the buildable area, just to delete that portion, right? Yes. And then uh, as far as the prohibition on building on steep slopes, the recommendation was to um, make it so that you could build on slopes over 30% if you have uh, an engineer has provided plans and DRB approval, right? Yes. The, I've read all these things, but I want to make sure I'm getting it <laughs> yeah. accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so, so we're, not, we're not going through and in, in exempting and not regulating it. We're simply going through and saying, we're taking away the prohibition to go through and say, okay, if you've got an engineer right. then, and we have a hearing, so Barb raised some concerns based on, um, well, there's the two different issues. One is, I mean, and they're tied together because slopes are part of what we've classified as unbuildable area. Right? Over so if they're unbuildable, so, then yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, um, but one is that we put forward these proposed density maximums in various districts uh, to the public and, and propose this, and we were conveying this message that we calculated this with the idea in mind that um, you would you would have a maximum for your particular lot based on buildable area. The actual number that you crunched would be based on that. So we would have the uh, a really you know a lot with a lot of unbuildable area and then all of the density that you would get if assuming it was all buildable kind of cramped in one area um, that was the concern and that's what we expressed to the public um, and then the other part of it was um, with slopes well maybe you can articulate your concern with the slopes I mean it was that it was it was that concern and then it gets pulled in with <coughs> slopes buildable though no longer unbuildable Right. I mean, those two issues can be separated, yeah. I think. You know, the question is, is it good practice mm -hmm. to build on a slope of 30% or more? You know, under, under the uh, regional planning, it's one of, the, uh, one of the members of the public brought up to me that the Regional Planning Commission um, recommends not building on slopes over 25%. 
so there is some, you know, there is a rationale that it's not good practice to build on, on steep slopes. Right. So, um, but rather than prohibiting it, then Mike's proposal that just says we, we need engineered plans. Um, the wording as written does not, um, you know, you could apply for a, a waiver, so it doesn't absolutely blanket prohibit any, any development uh, on, on slopes of 30% or more, but it just makes it much more difficult to do. Um, so that piece becomes one issue that I think, to my mind, we can separate. Um, my, made my, and I, I see if we keep a tight control on it, then perhaps, you know, this idea of having engineered plans makes sense. It's the other piece that has me more concerned, that if we eliminate what was a kind of, to my mind, a sort of bedrock aspect of how we established the densities in the first place, mm -hmm. um, and say, okay, a, a site that has a, you know, 30% or 25%, no, sorry, 30% slope, and it's a half an acre, is exactly the same as a, as a, um, site that is a flat site and half an acre and they should be able to have the same a number of units built on them that's where I think we get in to my mind into concern and it brings back some of the example projects that had happened you know within the last years year or so um, that were under cons concern with the public and particularly the issue of the Sibley Street project. Um, and so I took a look at if we were to say that that site was just, you know, we were going to calculate the density based on the total footprint of that site, how many units could we put on it, and how different would that actually be than what was proposed and very strongly reacted to against by the public. Yeah, um, so before we get to yeah, sorry, further into, into the, the substance weeds. of it, I, I just want to say, so the Planning Commission voted to adopt Mike's proposal, staff's pro proposal, um, but we also agreed that we should outline Barb's concerns and the risks associated with taking that approach to the City Council as we put forward this recommendation. So I asked um, Mike and Barb if they could draft m a memo to City Council. Um, we've got two different memos that we can either merge or file separately. I would encourage us to, to merge our memos um, so that we're speaking as one, with one voice. Um, but that's what this discussion tonight is going to be talking about. Right. I mean, yeah. How do we want to do yeah. that? And can, is, there, to, is it yeah, possible to come to some problem. kind of a compromise that then we could actually bring forward with, you know, to, at least from my standpoint, with a common voice. Yeah, well, we can talk about your examples because that might help to illustrate. Um, so, Barb wrote a memo and Mike wrote a memo reacting to that, responding to it. Um, so let's talk about, let's share. Um, oh. Maybe. Sure. another one. Yeah. You want one, Kirby? Sure. Yeah, thanks. As, as a starting place, do you mind? I mean, is there yeah, anything that you would want to change in your memo based on what Mike's response? Well, I think. I mean, for me, it kind of helps to kind of take a step back and say, you know, yeah, we can get into the weeds here. There's a lot of weeds. On his reaction, as well as as my original, but I think the. The point for me is really to look at what do we want to be able to accomplish uh, with whatever we determine is the best approach. And, um, and I totally agree that, that um, as we knew that when we went forward with this zoning that things were going to come up that were going to prove to be very difficult to apply. And um, at least from my standpoint, I think one of the issues had to do with the scale of the development that was being considered. And um, that, um, that this 30% or the buildable area uh, issue really comes up to my mind in terms of 
the uh, new multifamily development, not somebody trying to expand an existing house, uh, putting an addition uh, or, or something like that on. So it really, you know, how could we modify this to apply to that in one, lieu of? One of the things that Mike wrote in, his, in your memo is that um, the eliminating that buildable area aspect of the density calculations wouldn't allow for any more um, density than what's on the ground currently? Is the, did I interpret that correctly? From the zoning standpoint, so when we calculated those district densities that are in our zoning, we didn't remove the buildable area when we figured out what the density should be. We looked at what's actually on the ground. So removing the buildable area will change the amount of building potential from the current zoning because you're no longer going to be reducing that amount. But yeah, it, it, whether that makes a difference compared to what your neighbors, you know, looking at what's on the ground, um, from the zoning standpoint, probably not because the zoning was set up assuming we had flat buildable area in these neighborhoods when we found the 90% rules, we founded them. So Barb, what does the buildable area calculation provide that the other size scale massing requirements don't? Well, because I, I've been thinking about this, that it, to me, one of those elements of character of the neighborhood um, is is the fact that historically we've only built on relatively flat areas of a site. So we are not already <coughs> building on steep slopes historically. Mm -hmm. And if we want to maintain historical development patterns, which I you know, heard pretty strongly from the public that that was an, um, a desirable thing to do, that that's one of those aspects that we need to be considering as well. That unfortunately, you know, we want to say that our other Care, uh, our other pieces, our other requirements define character of the neighborhood, but they really don't. And that was actually the point of my doing the three examples that I did, because we could meet every one of those other criteria um, that we say are defining character of the neighborhood, but um, is this really, are, do those developments reflect the character of the neighborhood? Is that I'm not following, and okay. I think it's my fault. No, it's sorry. I'm sorry. Let me but. let me go back a bit. Um, we had said, oh, Mike said in his in his uh, response that one of the that we have other ways to right. make sure that development um, is in, consistent with neighborhoods, with the character of neighborhoods. One of them is footprint. One of them is setback. One of them is. Um, number of, potentially number of units, um, scale massing, articulation, all of those aspects. Um, and I guess my feeling is that those are not enough. Um, and that was why I felt strongly that when we inst instituted the, the piece about buildable area, um, what that did was it reflected the density of the build buildings that were occurring in an existing neighborhood. So it reflected the character of the neighborhood as well. That that, that um, um, as well as all of those other characteristics. So if we remove that one and say, we remove that criteria and we are left with just scale, massing, um, articulation, footprint, all of that, is that enough to maintain the character of the neighborhoods that we feel strongly about. And um, so that's why I did the examples, because I feel that it doesn't. the thought doesn't. that removing the uh, calculation based on buildable area would result, or and the prohibition on slopes, it's going to result in a change in character of the neighborhood because the buildings will be built on different Slopes? Is that Not so much the slopes, but the, yeah, if we, again, separate those two issues. So let's set aside building on a 30% slope. Okay. 
Um, is it that different from building on a 25% slope? Probably not. You know, so if we set that piece aside, but it has more to do with the density calculation mm -hmm. and and the fact that we represented to the public, there were a lot. There was a lot of concern among the public that our densities were too high, and we said, "But this is, you know, we we're we're going to make sure that any development that happens is consistent with neighborhoods because we've got this slope exclusion." But I think what I heard from Mike was that the the density calculations were calculated without that in mind. Oh, when the ninety percent rule was, yeah, right. But that was what people were coming up against and saying. So people that they were, were upset about the densities that we proposed, even though they reflect what's on the ground. What the, technically they too high, technically they reflect the what's on the ground because it's a, very well because it's an average. Like yeah, right. It, it's an average. So we were saying that we have this extra step that, that it came into the process to um, ensure that, that um, overdevelopment does not happen. So my understanding of that piece of the process, Kirby, were you with us at this point? I was, I was there near the end okay. when this happened, well, what you're talking about. Well, let me give my perspective and then sure. you can add yours or correct me. But, because um, I'm still not sleeping well and I just, my recollection is not as strong, my strong suit right now. But my, my recollection is that we assured the public that the buildable area being taken into account would prevent a really out of scale building from popping up in a neighborhood, you know, you, because everyone could just group, you could just group your density into one little corner of your parcel and then you would have this giant building. Um, and then we developed the other requirements, the scale, size, massing, footprint. Um, and I, my thought was that that got at the issue. So that was, that was my understanding. My understanding was was the same thing that we have all of these these other requirements that are getting at the character of the neighborhood issue, which is what people are at the heart of it. The public was concerned about the character of the neighborhood changing and density that's allowing distances densities that are too high would change their character of their neighborhood. So density became a proxy for character of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And John Adams has convinced me at this point, because he's talked about this a lot, and, and others that I've, that, I've, that I've heard talk about this that are the, with a planning background, have convinced me at this point to say that density is really, it's a um, red herring as far as for character of the neighborhood. It's easy for people, because it's a number, it's easy for people to, attack, to look at density and say, that's gonna determine what my neighborhood's like. But really, it's all the other rules that we have in place that determine what your neighborhood's like. Um, and density is just this looking in the wrong direction, and that's kind of like where, where by when, when this when this conversation played out, that's kind of where I ended up personally on it was realizing, because at the beginning I too was thought that density had a lot of importance, and mm -hmm. now I realize it's actually a pretty poor proxy for character of the neighborhood. Why? I'm it dictates I'm, the number of people that. It's like it's like of, you're, of you're, 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 yeah the number of units that are allowed on a parcel you know yeah um, so it could be it's, this it's a poor proxy Victorian that gets that split up into like five the, units but looks exactly the same yeah. okay and so that's you know yeah, it's no different bedroom, character wise uh, Victorian could get split into and there might be seven, there might be yeah, more yeah, humans seven, around yeah. but okay. um, but actually but, yeah but you would and, I'm sorry it might have parking it might have some other. Th uh, but, but we have our setback rules, we have a lot of zoning rules that just kind of put a, another like a real check on. You, it's very difficult to reach maximum density on any, any parcel. And, and the reason why we increase the amounts is basically because Mike determined that we're out of conformance anyway, we're like way over the old density requirements in all our neighborhoods. So we were just changed it to reflect reality. Right. Um, so, so that, that's what I remember. The rule was this test was done, and so if 90% of the parcels in this district would be in conformance with this density, then that seems like that's a good yeah. gauge for where we are and how what we want to maintain. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess I would argue with, you know, with Kirby's um, assertion that, that the number of housing units um, has no influence on the character of the neighborhood, because it definitely does. 
I mean, even, I'll tell you that my, my neighbors know that I have a two family house, not just a one family house. Um, it's, and it's really, and if I then suddenly took my house and changed it into five units, that would have a significant impact on my neighborhood, which is mostly one and two family houses. So that's... And I, I think my reply to that in the memo was that that really, really, really sounds like a proposal to amend the use table. Not, a, I mean, we, we keep getting off on this buildable area. You know, this, this is, I mean, this is, this is her parcel and I have to calculate her density on, on that slope map and it's, it's just, Oh, it's a slope map. Okay. That's a slope map. All the red is slope. Is slopes. The, the, the darkest red is the slopes that are over over thirty percent. Right. So it really becomes you know how do you calculate such a such a number so we can enforce and administer those rules without having a large test. But really, if if the concern is having a multifamily will change the character of my neighborhood. Right now, multifamily is either a permitted or a conditional use. Then the proposal should be. The problem isn't the fact that somebody's going to have a 5,000 square foot house. It's that they're going to have a 5,000 square foot house that's been broken into five or more units. Because it's if your concern is five or more units is the problem, then change the use table to go and say you can't have multifamily housing in this neighborhood. Nope. Not let's let's try to adjust the buildable area to the point that somebody can't. You know, if, if it turns out that most of Barb's parcel is 25% slopes, it's all going to be buildable, and she can build it there, and officially you'd be saying, yeah, that's fine. As long as it's 25% slope, it's okay that I have eight units. But if that's 30%, then it's not okay for me to have eight units. Well, I know it's an arbitrary number, but it was a number that we, could, we determined was at least a reasonable level. And at least some portions of that site will be over 30%. So that would automatically reduce the three quarter acre that exists now in terms of buildable area. If, uh, so the sketches that I did, which I don't know if, if anybody actually saw, yeah. had to do with um, whether, you know, what the actual effects of that would be. And I'll show this to Aaron because I don't know if you saw this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah. that's part okay. of this. It's um, dependent of the memo, right? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, the the issue being that you know, given if that entire three quarter parcel, three quarter acre parcel was considered, mm -hmm. and if we allowed a density bonus because it would be really easy to make it an infill PUD, then it would be possible to um, end up having um, a significant number of units eight units on a site that is currently two. Um, surrounded by, as you'll see, the, the numbers on the building surrounding it are the number of, of uh, housing units um, in the neighborhood. Um, and the, any of that development that's indicated there would meet any of the setback footprint, um, any of the other required parking as well requirements. And what I'm saying is that to my mind that um, is too dense. It doesn't reflect, um, you know, without that, if, if it would, basically if it went, if the slope exclusion was ignored, then um, about three units, you know, it would, it would bring it down to four units. Um, Bart, does, does this comply with all the setbacks? Mm -hmm. and, okay. Yep, footprint, yeah, the whole nine yards. And it's a 2,500 square foot footprint, so two units per floor. You could end up with four units. And as you see, looking at the massing of the building, it's not that different from the two adjacent properties just down the street. So it's not as if it's, a, it's totally out of scale. Um, so I think, you know, so that's sort of where I started was, okay, does, this, does it really make a difference? Um, what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, and I think it does. I mean, I think it has a serious impact because historically, the whole three quarters of an acre would never have been built on because it was a steep slope. Technically now we could, of course, we could build on, on the back portion of that, but historically it would not have been. That's why all the houses are along the street. 
in, in the relatively flat areas. Most of these sites in the back half of them do, in fact, have significant slopes on them. And as I pointed out before, I mean, I recognize that, that administratively, Mike would like to be able to tell people, you know, oh, your, you know what their slope percentage is. Um, but if somebody's going to be doing a development like this, they would need to be getting an engineered plan in the first place. And so any engineer, even any site um, designer, would be able to come up and, uh, with the percentage that's and I over think it works in that situation, but I think the issue administratively is that for any sort of addition or porch, or I mean, you'd have to get an engineer to help Mike know your buildable area. Well, that, and that I think that's my point is that it's to me it, it's more significant in terms of if we're increasing the number of, of units on the property, not just if we're adding on to an existing. It, yeah, right. it so using it as a density that. designation. What if you're increasing the number of units, but you're not changing the building at all? Or, I mean, or maybe you're adding in a small picture Yeah, yeah, well that's, yeah, but you're not yeah. changing the external yeah, appearance yeah. of the, well, I still think that there, you know, is, I mean, there's certainly a cost associated with that. There's a benefit to the property owner to add an additional unit to an existing building. So, the, and uh, to ask them to do a site plan is not unreasonable. And in some cases might already have to provide a site plan. So I, that's why I, I'm not sure that I understand that the requirement for having an engineer involved um, who could then designate what was 30% or so greater. So I think I'm better understanding this question about whether the use table should, is the better? I mean, it, it sounds like there's a question of how to deal with this issue of character in the neighborhood and whether it's going to be through density calculations, what uses are allowed. Um, but it's also a direct decision to be made, which I think is what I pointed out in the memo, yeah. which was that in, in her example, the only way she could do her example with that many, that much was to do a PUD, which would mean it would have to be, as we pointed out, the only way you should be able to exceed our densities is if it was a well-designed project. We spent a year or more working on our PUD standards mm -hmm. to death. Um, but for to be what she proposed, it would have to be a well-designed senior housing living facility that will provide perpetually affordable housing units in HERS-rated facilities with a score less than 50. <laughs> then you would be able to apply to get up to eight units. So it's not like everybody walking in gets to go and get this. You'd have to have a well-designed project, two public hearings, character of the neighborhood, and traffic are actual requirements. So if it doesn't meet character of the neighborhood, the neighbors are going to have an opportunity to, to discuss this point. But they're not, those are not criteria that are that difficult to meet, frankly. I mean, you know, a lot, most new buildings are going to meet the HERS rating. And, um, you know, it's, it's not... Perpetually affordable is more challenging than... That's right. Yeah. But that's not one that I would necessarily choose. You know, oh, you th there, are, there are eight different criteria to choose from. So and you would only have to do one of those? The two, first, well, not the three. three. I think two, it's two three. or three of them. I don't, okay. I don't remember yeah. which one it is for that so, one. So, um, yeah, so the particular criteria, um, I mean, we were trying to allow a lot of flexibility. Okay. So it's, uh, yeah, that, so perpetually affordable was not going to be one of them. But 88, you know, accessible, yes, you know, that kind of thing. So you have to do two of those to get a 25% bonus, density bonus, or three to get a 50% bonus? And oh, out okay. of the eight. So, I mean, the affordable. Two of the following, I see. So, yeah, I mean, we just, I just want to just throw it out. Yeah, if it's, yeah. yeah, but if yeah. it gets to a point where it's, it's, if, again, if it's to the point where under no circumstances, so in other words, even if a HERS rated senior facility with perpetually affordable housing is unacceptable, this still is not a buildable area question. This is, it absolutely shouldn't be allowed anywhere if we're not going to allow it for a HERS rating senior facility perpetually affordable, then, then it should just change the use table to say we're not going to allow it in that neighborhood. And, and otherwise, we're just... Not going to allow what in that neighborhood? Multifamily housing. 
if you're going to say you don't want a senior housing facility that's perpetually affordable and hers rated the best that we can do and you still are going to oppose that it's just not a use that you think should be allowed in the district and the rest of it is just a red herring that it's the buildable area that's the issue it's not the buildable area that's the issue it's the fact that it's multifamily. no i don't think that's that's not the way i see it is that no i don't have any problem with multifamily if there was enough site area that was flat that was reasonably uh, that it could accommodate that level of development that number of units so to me it's not about the use it's about the appropriateness of the development within the neighborhood but if it's across the street and where it's a little flatter if i recall liberty well enough it's not, not quite as steep as your backyard not. right no it's steep over here too so there's not a little bit more flat let's, hypothetically let's say, yeah. hypothetically yeah, let's say yeah. it let's say some of the let's, well, let's say it tight. is across the street and that it's the slope issues taken out of it so you'd be fine with the eight units going in and that same well there is there are um properties down the street where right. there are flatter you yeah know, i used to live in one of them yeah the the one on, across the street that has i think five units in it there's, and that's a, you know, it's a, it's on the corner of Liberty and Loomis. There's a six unit that I used to live in, and then across from that, which is also on the corner of Liberty and Loomis, a different corner. There's, I don't know how many units are there. No, it's there's, huge. there's only, I think there are only five or six. In it's that only one five too. or six yeah. in that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I know, yeah, that, so I know, those, I know that that's that is part of the neighborhood is large multifamily. Um, yeah, units. except that that's not that's not in the same district. That's not in our res six thousand. It's in res. The corner of Liberty and Loomis yeah. is in a different one. Yeah, because okay. this is the line. This is the dark line here. Is oh, the dividing oh, you point. live on the dividing. Yeah, line. I do. Sorry, I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so without the bonuses, fewer units would be able to be built on that side of the line. More units. To no, she, without the density bonus. Without yeah. her on yes. Fewer yes. on right. her side. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, right, but more on my neighbor's side, by the way, right. who has a bigger flat area now. So, um, just because they're in Res 3000. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that I think, to me, it, this whole issue of buildable area reflects a characteristic of the neighborhood. So if we have a different way that we can get to that point without, you know, using buildable area as that criteria, then I'd be fine with doing that. It's just that somehow, we need to be able, I mean, because people value the historic character of our neighborhoods, that's why they want to move here. How do we retain those characteristics while still allowing for additional infill development? So what's the, I'm sorry, what's the core characteristic that you're seeking to preserve? Because that's what I'm, I'm not quite understanding. The characteristic of the neighborhood having to do with the um, pattern of development and the, specifically, uh, specifically along the street, the streetscape, um, you know, we could say, you know, there's a certain pattern, there's a certain size, which, and some of those elements are reflected in other er, uh, criteria, such as footprint and setback and, and um, articulation and our other art architectural criteria. Mm -hmm. But other elements of the building pattern that has developed over time it's sort of like what what kirby and i were just talking about you know as you move through down a street the development pattern changes right. and appropriately what happens is that the um, particular district that those properties are in changes as well but historically what's been reflected um, is not what we're proposing could be built now and and i think that what we're proposing is a significant change to what has historically developed and and i, I feel a little dense because i'm still not understanding either <laughs> i mean aaron's question is, is hitting at it for me because what i see as <coughs> the only thing that we're giving up is regulating the the, the number of people that's that's why I feel so I mean I feel like we've got all of the external um, regulations to ensure that buildings are near the street facing that their front doors are facing the street that they have consistent <coughs> scale massing 
and I just get really concerned about saying that a certain number of people in a home reflects the character of the neighborhood, and that's that's what I'm. No, I don't. Yeah, I, and I don't think that that's. It, it may, it, the number of family units you might is basically what you're saying. You're not yes. really saying number of people right. necessarily, um, and and I you know I agree that we can increase the number of family units. We can increase the number of family units in existing buildings, and essentially have very little impact on the character of the neighborhood, which is what we were discussing earlier. That has minimal impact. But once we start looking at infill development, we have to be much more careful about that in terms of what's the impact. Um, and, and that's why we have all of those design standards to ensure that. Right. Well, I mean, we, you know, I, my other example was the was the Sibley Street, and and I met every single one of the setbacks, articulation, and and footprint, and still ended up with, you know, tw I can't remember now, 12, 14 units. Um, 12, yeah. Um, and those 12 units could be built if you consider the entire property and, um, uh, and don't exclude the 30% slope of which there is a significant amount on that, on that property. So we're running out of time. Do you have one more follow-up question on that? It looks like we've run out of time. No. I, I, I mean, I, I... We are out of time, actually. Yeah. So I'm going <laughs> to... Um, Thanks, Leslie. I think first I want to know, do the commissioners want to reopen this discussion? I mean, there was a vote, there was a decision. Do we want to reopen that decision and continue this discussion um, at future meetings? That's the first question. The second question is, if the answer is no, how do we want to move forward with preparing a memo for city council? Um, so, and I, I just want to mention both parts to that question. Guys, a, a point of clarification first. Yeah. Um, the decision that we are looking to reconsider is specifically what? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think the, it's like, so, oh, go ahead. Is it, is it the, the 3002C change and yes. the which, which is 3002? I don't have the... One sorry, the, the, sorry. The, 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 the buildable, buildable area. area one. Okay. Yeah. And the, the, the two, later one is the... Yeah, the two that might, on that might teed up at the beginning of the discussion. So the decision was to um, recommend to city council that we eliminate the... That's... Buildable area... Okay, so, uh, so the density calculations based on buildable area. Okay, so that's the 3002C, and then, and then, then this other, the, yes, the, then, hear, the hearing threshold? Well, yeah, that, and then that, we would allow okay. for some buildings on slopes. Okay. But requiring engineering. With engineering. And design review board. Okay. Development review board. Because there's a design review board. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> 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 make sure it's... Um, so that that was the decision, yep. and then um, I asked for memos to be drafted, and, and so that led to this uh, point okay. in time. So, um, do people want to reopen the discussion to see if there's a different substantive um, solution? I know Barb does. I know she'll <laughs> <laughs> vote positively on that. But are others interested in that, or? The reason why I ask it like this in a formal way is because we, we've talked about this a lot. We've had an affirmative vote, and I think it's important that we be conscious of our time. If we've had a vote and other people don't want to continue <coughs> the discussion, then I want to respect that and, and move forward, and we can draft a memo that cautions the city council of the risk of adopting this approach. I think that's perfectly reasonable. But if people do want to revisit this and have a little bit more background information, since not everybody on the commission was there for all of the public hearings leading up to the zoning adoption, then you know that's certainly a welcome uh, way to move forward too. 
uh, another point of clarification, uh, the vote that we took, that we... Uh, so you weren't a part of? That I was not a part of. <laughs> Does that include a requirement that we send memos to the city council? It did not at that time. No. No. That's not something we needed to vote on. Yeah, I okay. think it was more we decided as a group that it made sense to... I mean, generally speaking, when we submit recommendations to the city council, Mike usually puts together a memo and presents here's why we've put these mm -hmm. together. Uh, in this one, we felt the need to be a little bit more involved in, in okay. drafting of this particular recommendation. Uh, especially since, you know, BARD concerns are shared by others um, in the public. And Ooh, that's fair. For, for me, I'm not finding that I'm like moving in my point of view on it, but I thought it was important for BARB to be able to have a platform. So, so I'm satisfied that, that she's able to plead her case at this point and would probably be in favor of moving it to city council. It's kind of the same boat. Any differing opinions? Opinion. I'm going to abstain. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable, yeah. Aaron, really. Yeah. Okay. Well, hearing none, um, here's what I propose. Um, I'm going to nominate Kirby to try to interweave these memos a little bit from the points of view, and then okay. to get Barb and Mike to review and sign off on that. Is that okay? Yeah, you're that sounds good. Told we, to do that? we use both semi electronic versions of your memos. I, mean, I probably already have them, but the latest electronic version of your memo you or do document. Have it. But it's in Word. He can he can actually take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take I have a word version of it. Yeah, you should have know? a word version okay. of it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, find, I'll find I don't the latest one. PDFs sent or words. And then, Kirby, do you think that you could do that so that we could discuss it at the January fourteenth meeting? Yeah. A, month a little away. something to do over the holidays, Kirby. <laughs> 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 and if not, we can move it back, but just, yeah. just sure. to give us kind yeah. of goalposts yeah. here. Yeah. Um, okay. And then, oh, thank you. Barbara, I also want to mention that you have said that different members of the public have concerns, they should absolutely submit their comments or come in and, and provide them mm -hmm. verbally um, because maybe there is something in their nuance. Maybe they'll say it in a way that is uh -huh. <laughs> well, I don't, differently. You know, based on what they've said to me, um, you know, I think that they're... We've captured everything. We've captured everything, okay. right. Yeah. So, so one clarification, we've, we've got the landscaping moving forward so that can get fixed yes if this is waiting till January it's gonna miss the window for the adoption of that one did we want to is the excluding the the buildable areas piece I mean because and you can correct me if I'm wrong it's the buildable areas piece that's really your concern we could move forward the other two piece, the other piece that goes through on the table, adjusting table, say you can build over 30% with a hearing and engineering. And flipping those tables. There was something about the And flipping the tables, the tables. yeah. It's, right, it's yeah. the strikeout if version. If you're comfortable with that, Barb, then I think yeah. that, that... Then there's an alternative. At least I can start going up and getting that to change, and we... we and if the buildable areas ends up on the long adoption list then it ends up on the long adoption list but that's up to you guys to decide whether you want to move buildable area forward but i would at least go and move the the engineered 30 yeah, percent stuff if we yeah can do that, I would yeah i mean that would still require an engineer to be involved but yeah and we have anyway. engineers downstairs who do our reviews i mean just as there's stuff downstairs right now for proposals on college street that can't get building permits until they get approval from engineers downstairs um, but yeah. that would that would move those two forward and, and leave the buildable areas question as a separate item okay yeah so do I have a motion to move the staff recommendation for the steep slope part of the zoning to City Council with the landscape that the steep slope aspect of the build, um, allowing building on areas yes. of 30%. Yes. Right, because the steep slope is two parts. Right, okay. fair enough. Thank 
not, not sure that was clarified, but anyway. Yeah. So I'll withdraw and restate the motion. Yeah. The motion on a seat. All right. We try, we try to make it easy for everyone else. Yeah. Rather than say, give me a motion. Yeah, right, right. You come right. Up with it. Well, Barb, do you want to make the motion? Why you uh, the the am, how about the amendments to section 3007? Okay. Which Three, is the steep slopes. 3007. Okay, so do I have a motion to recommend to City Council the staff recommendations for the revisions to 3007 steep slopes? That, that prohibited construction on slopes of 30%. Yes. Mm -hmm. To amend that yeah, section. Just, amend yeah, that's the, those yeah. are the only changes to sections 3007. The other changes are in 3002. Two, right. So the only changes in 3007 are to the to that table that Tet prohibited. Table. Yeah. Okay. And and the area, areas, I guess I'd forgotten we did the square footage area changes too. Yeah, well, that was why, yeah. just for simplicity of the motion, I said the changes that were proposed to 3007. Okay, all right. Then it encompassed some of those minor. Okay, do I have such a motion? I will move that motion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that no Whatever that motion was. Second, second. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All those is abstaining? <laughs> okay. So the motion carries. Um, that is item six. We're going to skip item seven. Item eight, quickly, let's look at the minutes. I just like to keep up with these. There is a. Um, Aaron's one Kasiki wrong is still okay. wrong. In got one two. Spot. Got two of the three. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> I'll, uh, yeah, I, I make. I usually make these fixes, so okay. Okay. I can. Any, anything else with these? Okay. Um, I move we approve. I'm second. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. Okay, motion carries. Minutes are approved. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Moved. Okay, sir. Second. second. I'll second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for all your help. This is complicated.